Hello and welcome to Very Easy Lessons for the DG 8 Bass Melodeon and this is Lesson 3. You need to know that these lessons are particularly for uh, a melodeon that's got two rows. One row is D, one row is G and has eight basses. If you have another type of melodeon, uh, these lessons may confuse you but you might find them interesting. And you might ask, why am I giving you these lessons? Well, for a start, um, I've been a professional guitar teacher all my life. I've been teaching young children to play the guitar uh, in schools uh, for about 40 years. So I do know a thing or two about teaching. I've only been playing the melodeon about a year at the time of doing this video. Um, but I thought it'd be quite interesting to pass on the things that I've learned to you. I was looking for something like this when I first started. Uh, and so uh, I thought I would actually provide this uh, for absolute beginners on this instrument. Once you've uh, learnt a few things from these videos, I would strongly encourage you to seek out other teachers, uh, more advanced stuff. There's loads of DVDs and books that you can buy. Uh, two people I really recommend. Uh, first of all, George Garside, and I've got his tutorial here. This is what I learned from in the first place, and it's an absolutely brilliant book. But it's uh, the DG Melodeon written by George Garside, and it is a really excellent book. And I learned loads and loads from that, and I still go back to it and play the pieces out of it. Uh, but even that, I would say, is probably a little bit advanced if you are very, very new to the instrument, or you may be very new to reading music, and that's what these videos are all about. Another person I'd encourage you to uh, look at is John Kirkpatrick, or JK as he's known in the business. Um, he's an absolutely incredible uh, Melodeon player, and he's got uh, a DVD out, well it's actually two DVDs, uh, of him showing you loads and loads of tricks and tips on the, on the DG. So uh, have a look at that, um, I've got that as well, and um, there's a wealth of information in that. I must say I've been very encouraged by the response I've had from the first uh, two lessons um, and there's a few things I wanted to talk about uh, from those two lessons before I move into this one. Uh, one of those things was there was a little bit of controversy about how I used my left hand on the bases um, and I'll talk about that a bit more in lesson four uh, and you'll, you'll understand what I'm going on about when you see that lesson but there's a, there's a few things to say about that. I wanted to say something about fingernails as well. Um, it's probably worth mentioning that you do need to keep your fingernails uh, fairly short. Something like that length is probably about right. If your fingernails are a bit long, they're gonna be clacking on the buttons. Uh, I mean, the, the, the Melodeon does make a bit of a racket anyway with the buttons, depending on which one you've got. Um, I'm very lucky I've got a really, really high quality uh, Dino Buffetti Melodeon, but I've also got some old honers as well, which are great. They do clack a bit, uh, so if you've got long fingernails, apart from the fact that you're not going to get the feel uh, off the instrument that you would with your, with your fingertips, your fingernails aren't going to give you that feel, you will get a lot of noise. So I would suggest you, you know, keep your fingernails fairly short. So let's put my box on and let's get going. In the first video lesson, I talked a bit about how uh, belts and buttons can scratch the back of your melodeon. And when I was playing after that, I noticed that the, the straps at the bottom of my melodeon, where it's fixed to the melodeon, had got some uh, buckles, which I, I think were starting to rub on the bottom of the box. And by the way, if I say box, uh, that is uh, that is what we call the melodeon. Uh, instead of saying melodeon, which is quite a long word to keep saying, uh, we tend to call them a box. So if you hear me say the word box, you know what I'm talking about. And so yeah, so my, my buckles were rubbing on the bottom of the box and so I mentioned this to my wife and she came up with this ingenious and very cheap uh, remedy. And what she did was she sewed uh, two of her little socks in matching colours to my strap more or less. So she wrapped them round the strap and put a little stitch in them. And that is going to save loads of scratches on the bottom of my melodeon. There's probably a better way of doing it, but that was, uh, that was free and very quick and it, it looks quite nice and I must admit I was worrying quite a lot when I was playing that I was actually scratching uh, the bottom of the, of the box so that's been good. Something I did in my first lesson that was a real schoolboy error when I put my melodeon on and I'll try and show you what that was now. Okay so I'm going to put one strap through it. So when I put this side on um, the strap got caught around the fingerboard and uh, sometimes can make a bit of an embarrassing noise 
it didn't in my first video but um, so basically make sure the strap is behind the board when you put it on something else I wanted to talk about and I didn't in my first video lesson was uh, when you undo the straps at the bellows here they are top and bottom my strap didn't fall off amazing it is said that you're not supposed to try and force the bellows open uh, but use the air button um, and it's supposedly you can damage the reeds although I've been told by uh, a real box expert that that's actually not the case that you'd, you'd be really unlucky to, to damage the reeds but um, I'd say generally it's probably a pretty good idea to uh, make sure you press the, the button the air button to open and close the bellows unless you're playing because if you're playing air is getting in anyway so you don't have to worry about that and also it's pr also worth mentioning once you finish playing to always do the bellow straps up before you store your box away because um, you know it keeps them in, in good condition and uh, keeps them nice and tight and uh, you know it's much easier to, to, to pick the, the, the box up afterwards. Something I wanted to mention was what do you do with your box when you're not playing? Um, do you put it away in its case? That sounds like a great idea but for years I've always t told my kids at school don't put your guitar away um, in its case because you probably won't play it but leave it out somewhere somewhere safe and where you're going to see it and then you're more likely to pick it up and play it and I think the same could be said for the melodeon if you store it away in its box somewhere on its case somewhere you're going to perhaps think twice about picking it up and playing it so as long as it's somewhere safe and maybe you could you know, have a little dust cover for it so if you've got to get the box out of its box uh, it might make you think twice about practicing and that's a bad thing right so I would say keep the thing out I mean, this is a very expensive melodeon but I still keep it out of its box and I just put a dust cover on it as long as it's in a, a dry um, and dust free environment it's absolutely fine remember these are very easy lessons for the DG 8 bass melodeon these are very early days so you know I will be going through some very very simple things some real fundamental things uh, if you are a very experienced player then probably these videos aren't for you but if you are an absolute beginner they will be ideal uh, I won't be doing particularly uh, very cool tunes and songs. Um, I mean, the first one was Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, uh, and uh, and the next tune I'm going to teach you, uh, actually not in this video, um, in the next video is also a pretty uh, kind of childlike tune, but good fun to play. So you're thinking, oh no, what's he going to do today? Uh, is this going to be boring? Well, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to teach you and show you how to play the scale of D major. So I know what you're thinking, uh, you're thinking scales, that sounds like boring old piano lessons, um, what's this going to be? I can honestly tell you on this instrument particularly scales aren't boring and they're actually very interesting and incredibly useful. Uh, first of all they will teach you what notes the buttons give you and they will also improve your right hand fingering technique. So um, we are going to look at the scale of D major in two octaves. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Before I get to this scale, uh, I need to say that I've actually produced uh, 11 pages so far, at the time of doing this video, of music theory for beginners. These theory sheets are not exclusive to the melodeon. Uh, they are for anyone who's playing an instrument in the treble clef. So it'd be very useful for a guitarist, uh, a flautist, a melodeonist, if that's the right word, um, uh, the right hand of the piano, and just generally I've made them as simple and as accessible as possible so if you go to my website which is www.daddylongles.com and go to uh, the menu which currently is called um, tabs and music sheets it may change over time uh, if you click on that at the foot of that um, you will see um, an item called uh, basic theory information sheets and if you click on that uh, that will bring up 11 uh, PDFs which you can either look at on screen or if you prefer to you can download and print it out for yourself. As I say it's real sort of dumbed down stuff, uh, nice and simple without blinding you with science um, and I've done that because I don't want to cover every music sheet that I provide for you in theory. I want to uh, leave plenty of room for the actual music and any instructions specific to that tune so these will be useful and I'll strongly suggest that you print them out so that you can keep them handy if you get stuck on anything 
But uh, as I say, any new crops up in any tune that I teach uh, or in any lesson like today, then I will deal with it uh, in that particular video. So if you are desperate to learn a new tune, uh, well, the next two videos will uh, we'll be doing a new tune. Uh, but in today's lesson, like I said, we're going to be learning and playing the scale of D major. Uh, so let's get into that. As I often do when I'm uh, teaching, uh, I turn to the trusty piano uh, to, to show you things, and I'm going to do that now um, for this scale. So here we have our piano keyboard, and on our melodeon we are going to play these notes. D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D, keep going, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D. So on a piano keyboard, if you don't know your way around a piano keyboard, um, the D is actually between the two black notes. Uh, I always think of it as the dog in the kennel. Like right? dog begins with D, you know, you get the idea. So this is the D. And we are starting on the D, which is uh, one up from middle C. Now the middle of the piano, uh, Okay, it's about here, where my finger is. This note here is a C. So we're starting from D, D above middle C. And that's where we, that's the first note that we're going to play on our melodeon. Now, if I was to play all of these notes... Okay, that's every note uh, across two octaves. Uh, that's called chromatic. That's not what we want here. We are going to miss... Uh, quite a few of those notes out. Um, if you've looked at my music theory information sheets, you'll perhaps know this bit already, but just to uh, confirm it, um, when we do a major scale, we don't use every single note that there is in music. We miss some out. And this is how it works. We start on the first degree of the scale. So a scale of D major, pretty obviously, it's got to start on the note D. Now the first step is a tone. It's from here to here. We miss this one. If I was to go from here to the note nearest, this black note here, which is D sharp, that would be a semitone. We don't want that, we want a tone. So we jump from the D, I'm going to use my finger so the camera can pick it up. Obviously I've used my thumb normally. I want you to be able to see the notes. So you go from D to E, there's your first step, a tone. Now the next step is also a tone. So uh, a semitone will take you to F, so a tone will take you to F sharp. So we've got tone, tone, the next step is a semitone, so come up to the G, okay, next door neighbour, F sharp to G, so we've got tone, tone, semitone. And don't forget, tones and semitones are not notes. Uh, a semitone is, okay, the shortest distance between two notes, next door neighbours if you like, and a tone is two semitones. So, so far we've got tone, tone, semitone, keep going, tone, 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 semitone. Okay, so your major scale formula is tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone. Now you probably noticed that within that scale I played two black notes, I played two sharps, I played F sharp and C sharp. If I went from a C to a C, okay, I'm sure you know by now, you don't need any black notes to make that sound right. That's a, a C major scale, all white notes. But when you come into the key of D major, there are two sharps. F sharp and C sharp. So obviously today on the melodeon we're going to play two octaves worth of that, from this D here to this D up here. Distance between those two Ds is two octaves. So that is why um, at the beginning of the stave you can see two sharp signs. Uh, one sharp sign is on the top line. Uh, if there was a note on that line it would be an F. The other sharp sign is in the third space up. If there was a note in that space it would be a C. And that tells us that we sharpen all F's and C's. Not, we need to make this clear, it's not just the sharps uh, 
on that particular line and that particular space at that particular pitch. It's all Fs and all Cs. And if we come to any of those, we have to raise them or sharpen them. So all Fs and Cs. And you can actually see that in the first bar, the third note is on the first space of the stave. Normally that would be an F, but because of that uh, key signature, uh, we raise it to F sharp. Uh, it just so happens in the second bar, the third note is a C sharp, which, which actually is at the same pitch as that sharp sign in the key signature. Uh, but if you look on the next uh, stave down, when we jump up to the higher octave, um, the F is sharpened. Okay, and then the one but last note, that note which is on the second ledge line above the stave, okay, that is also sharpened because of the key signature. So all Fs and all Cs are sharpened, uh, so that we say that in the key of D major, it's F sharp and C sharp at the beginning of each stave, just to remind you of that. So let's find the first note of our scale. And the scale of D major is um, obviously found on the D row. The D row is the outside row, the row furthest away from the bellows. This row here is the uh, D row. Uh, the third button from the chin, uh, if you press it and push the bellows in, that is the note D. Okay, and use finger number one. Now play the same button and pull out, and that's the next note in the scale, which is E. Same button, same finger. We've got first two notes of our scale. Right? And if you know your scale is Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, Do, then that's Do and Re, isn't it? Okay. Uh, don't get bellows, don't shove them around. It's not a violent action, just tiny movements is all you need. And although you could go, you could get the second note just by pulling on the bellows without playing the button again. Um, I would recommend you, you don't do that. Actually physically play the button each time you want to hear the note. So first two notes. And now we're going to go to button four and the note F sharp. Finger two, push in, play the same button, pull out the G. See what we've got so far? D, E, F sharp, G. So two buttons, four notes, and two fingers. Now you're going to go to button five, uh, finger three. This is the note A, pushing in, pulling out, gives you the note B. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, six notes of our major scale. Uh, now you know that you've got eight notes in the scale, so we're too short. So we've got two more to go. So let's just go up to there again. Finger one, finger two, finger three. Now, the last bellows action was a pull um, on button five, and that was giving me the note uh, B. Now the final two notes of the scale are C sharp and D. Now what you do is you, you go to button six and you use your little finger, fourth finger, pull again, that's the C sharp, and then you play the same button with your little finger and push in and that's your, uh, that's your final note D, an octave higher on that one. Just have a listen to the scale. So in terms of pushing and pulling, you've got push, pull, push, pull, push, pull, pull, push. And that's the eight degrees of the scale. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, and notice I use four buttons and I use four fingers. Now, uh, like I said, there's a bit of controversy about the left hand, whether to use the fourth finger or not, and I'll get to that in a later lesson. But with the right hand, uh, it's an absolute no-brainer. You really must use all four fingers, um, because if you don't, you're going to rapidly run into trouble. So here's a great opportunity for doing just that. And like I said earlier, you know, playing the scales um, is interesting, and it's also incredibly useful from a fingering point of view. So we've used four buttons, four fingers to get our first octave 
ascending. Ascending obviously means going up. And it's a bit confusing, isn't it? Because the sounds are going up, the pitch is going up, but you're travelling towards the floor. So it's a little bit confusing. You just have to get used to that. So if you look at the music sheet, you will see that that first octave has taken up two bars of music because we've used eight crotchets. Four crotchets in each bar, and uh, each bar has four beats, so you know, it's very simple. The names of the notes are on top of the notes, and you've also got the fingering in there as well. The tiny numbers are your right hand fingers. Now we're going to play this uh, scale in two octaves. That's the lower octave. We're now going to uh, play the upper octaves. So we're going to come further down towards the floor, still on that same row. The last note we played was D, which as I said was an octave higher than that D, and we used our little finger. Now if you look at the second stave of music, you'll see that uh, the first note on that stave is that note again. Now if you're going to play this two octave scale in one kind of go, you don't need to replay that note, move straight on to the note E. But we'll, we're just going to play this second octave uh, in isolation, so, so we will play that note again. Um, so that's the little finger. So the next note is E, and that's button 7, and it's uh, finger 1, because we've run out of fingers, so we've got to start again. Uh, it's a pull. Okay. And then the next note is F sharp, uh, pushing in. Okay, same finger, same button. And then we go to G, which is the next button down, button 8. That's a pull, finger 2. Same button pushing in will give you uh, A, uh, and that is finger 2. And then go to the next button down, which is button 9. Um, and you pull out. Do something quite weird now. So we've just played B, which is uh, button 9 on the pull, finger 3. And surprisingly, the next note is not on the same button. In fact, you go down to the button below that, button 10, which on my melodeon is the last one. It may not be on yours. Finger 4, a pull again. And the final note of the scale, you've got to come back up to button 9, finger 3, and push. And you've got the D. So the second octave is not the same as the first octave in terms of pushing and pulling, fingering. It's very different, isn't it? Let's have a listen to it. So if you remember, I'm starting with finger four because I'm really on the end of the previous octave. So that was the upper octave of the two. So what we've done there, we've covered two octaves. We've gone from this D up to this D, which is a two octave span. Okay, we've played the scale and we've duplicated it over two octaves. Remember to use fingers one, two, three, and four on these buttons, and then on these buttons. Okay, you need to definitely move your fingering down. Don't try and go up with one finger. Um, you might think it's better, you might think it's quicker, but in the long run, it's not gonna do you any good, so make sure you do use your fingers properly. So let's play that two octave scale all in one go. And when I get to the end of the lower octave, and I play that D, I'm not going to play it again, I'm going to keep going to the E and so on. And let's play it uh, with a kind of a, a rhythm, a bit of a tempo. So one, two, three, four. <laughs> And that is the two octave scale. And as you can see, that's a pretty good finger exercise. And as you're doing it, you know, you're learning the notes, you're learning what notes the buttons are giving you, which is really very important. So what is also interesting here is that you may have noticed that all the notes on the push are all notes found in the major chord of D. Now, don't get confused here. The major chord is not the same as the major scale. The, the scale is the eight notes. All right. The chord, the major chord of D, is uh, a chord, a group of three notes, uh, and it's formed from three particular degrees of the scale, three notes from the scale. It's formed from the first, 
a third, and the fifth. If you actually play buttons three, four, and five together, that would give you a chord of D major. And it doesn't matter what order uh, you play those notes, you can jumble them up, but you could play uh, four, five, and six. Or you play five, six, and seven. Or six, seven, and eight. Or seven, eight, and nine. Um, you can hear that they're all D major chords, but different inversions. So all of those notes are on the push, and they are either a first, or a third, or a fifth. In other words, they are either a D, or an F sharp, or an A. So that you can see that the chord of D major is not the same as the scale of D major. The scale is the eight notes, and the chord is three notes played, usually simultaneously, like this. But of course, you can arpeggiate it, run up and down. Okay, and we'll come to that in a much later lesson. Having said all that, if you play uh, button uh, three uh, on the bass side, uh, on the outside, and pull out, you've got a D major chord, a D chord, uh, just from pressing one button. So, what notes do we get from the buttons uh, when we pull? Okay, well, basically, they're all the notes that aren't in the major chord. So let's have a listen to those. Let's play these, those four buttons there. Um, right, button three on the pull is the note E, and that's the second degree of the scale, D, E, one, two. Okay, uh, button four on the pull is a G, which is the fourth. Okay, button five on the pull is a B, okay, which is the sixth, and button six on the pull is a C sharp, which is the seventh. So the four degrees of the scale that aren't in the major chord are the second, the fourth, the sixth, and the seventh. So those four notes on the pull, and these three notes on the push, and of course that one there, the, the top octave, you've got your eight notes. Don't get the first degree of the scale and the eighth degree of the scale, are both D's, but they are an octave apart. Uh, from a reading music point of view, please notice how the last four notes of the upper octave scale are on ledger lines. They're on those extra little lines uh, above the stave. They've, they've gone too high for the stave, so we've had to draw extra little extensions on the stave to house them. Uh, those last four notes are uh, A, B, C sharp and D. The A is on the first ledger line above the stave. Uh, the B is in the space above that ledger line or between that ledger line and the next one up. Uh, the C sharp is on the second ledger line above the stave. And the final D is in the space uh, above the second ledger line or between the second ledger line and what would be the third ledger line. You don't have to draw that one on top, you just leave that. So you can see that because of the way the melodeon works, and because it doesn't uh, have every single note in music, uh, you jump up very quickly from this low D here uh, to this high D here. And it's not a, not a great distance to travel, isn't it? And that, of course, is one of the joys of this instrument. Um, it's not a massive span uh, to, to get somewhere fast, so that's, that's great, isn't it? Other things you might want to try, you might want to try and play the scale going up, ascending, and also coming back. Let's try that. And let's go down now. And it's a bit trickier coming down uh, than it is going up, I have to say. It takes quite a bit of practicing. Uh, you might also want to try the same thing on the G row, uh, the row nearest the bellows. Start on the third button and work your way down exactly the same way, and you'll hear a, a hopefully a two octave scale. I'm saying hopefully on my melodeon, I can't do that because as you'll hear, I'm going to run out of notes. So you see I'm, I'm missing a note there and although I've got four melodeons, four boxes, I haven't got one I can actually do that on. Uh, my Sauterelle, uh, which you'll see presently, if you haven't already seen it in my other 
blog videos is a 2.5 row. It's got some extra notes here, but it's a fourth button start, and so it's missing that top uh, that top G note there. I've got a Hona Erica DG box, and that would have given me that top G note, but I actually had that button retuned uh, because I wanted some special notes for a tune I was learning, so I can't do it on that. And my other box is a Hona Erica, but in the key of G and C. So this row is G, this row is C, and so obviously um, I can't show you there because it would be the wrong key. But you know, if you've got a standard poker work, standard Erica, uh, this is only a 19 button box. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten buttons there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine buttons there. Generally, uh, boxes have a few more buttons than that, and you won't have any trouble playing the two octave scales on both rows. Anyway, I hope you found that interesting. As you can see, it's not boring, is it? And it's a really good thing to practice. Uh, and you know, I would strongly advise you to practice that, and, uh, and then you'll be ready to move on to our next tune.